Jerusalem is God's countdown clock for humanity's survival. In other words, think about, and in just a moment, we're going to read the most extensive description, and you can start looking for it in your Bible. It's the second to the last book of the Old Testament, and we're going to read all of chapter 12 and all of chapter 14. Think about when Zechariah was written. In fact, you can go today to Zechariah's tomb. Uh, it's the tomb of the prophets. It's on the side of the Mount of Olives, and remember, uh, that's where Christ is going to return. So Zechariah, more than any other prophet, describes this event. And what's amazing is he was sitting in Jerusalem looking at the Mount of Olives while he was writing under the inspiration of God's Spirit all these, these words. And what he says is that Jerusalem is how you're going to know by watching Jerusalem, you will know when the Lord's going to return. You're going to know. It's a countdown to Jerusalem. What he says is that the Lord returns when you see Jerusalem here completely surrounded by armies. And when those armies have broken through and ravaged two-thirds of the city, they've wiped out two-thirds, and they've, the armies have, it says, have pillaged and plundered and murdered and raped and, and destroyed two-thirds of the city. And when there's only one-third left, Jesus comes back. So I guess there is a sign for his coming, but it's kind of all happening at once, and so it's kind of hard, unless you're in it, to know. Because it's when Jerusalem is completely surrounded and only a third of the city is left. But what's fascinating is if you read Zechariah, Zechariah wrote his work in about the 6th century B.C. What did Jerusalem look like in the 6th century B.C.? It was basically in ruins. It had a wall up that Nehemiah uh, had helped Actually, Zechariah is written in the 500s, which is the 6th century B.C., and it's just, just parallel to the post. Remember a few weeks ago I told you that the, the nine of the minor prophets are before the exile, so they're called pre-exilic. That means they were written before uh, 586 B.C., and three are post-exile. That means they were written after 586 B.C. And uh, actually, they were written, most of them, after 516. And they are Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. So those last three of the minor prophets, and Zechariah is right in the middle, are written in this time period when Jerusalem is all knocked down, burned, desolate, Nehemiah is coming back and motivating the people to build the walls in 52 days, which is unbelievable. Nehemiah's walls are still there. If you go to Jerusalem today, you can see them. In fact, there's some parts you can actually see some structures he built that are underneath um, what, what we would call the, the Temple Mount area. And you, there's tunnels under there and you can go through. But why I'm saying this is, when Zechariah writes that Jerusalem is going to be, he actually says it's going to be the center of the whole world's attention. Uh, he said it's going to become a heavy burden for the whole world. When he wrote that, Jerusalem was a backwoods town, falling down, blackened, charred stones, far from any trade route, far from any seaport, far from anything. In fact, he's probably wondering, what's the deal? Who would want this city? It's broken down in ruins, and there's nobody, hardly 50,000 people living here. How come God says it's going to be the center of the world? Well, let's look at why. And this is why. When Jesus told his disciples about the future, remember Jesus spent more chapters on that sermon, this sermon, Actually, it goes Matthew 24 and 25, Mark 13, Luke 21. Jesus spends four chapters answering one question. 
Four chapters, and it's not just four chapters, it's four chapters in the most amazing time of his life. It's just before he gets crucified. It's almost the last topic he covers in the Gospels. And he talks about the future. The last full sermon Jesus delivers in four chapters is about the future. That's how important it is to God that we understand it. It's called the Olivet Discourse to theologians because it was written on the Mount of Olives. See, I mean, it was given. Jesus actually stood on the Mount of Olives looking at Jerusalem, preaching this this message. Uh, Jesus framed his words about the rest of the history of this planet by the sight of Jerusalem and all its earthly glory spread in front of him. Jesus centered everything that he explains to us about the future of earth. And he centers it on Jerusalem. If you look at, in fact, let's do that. Look at Matthew 24 and verse 2. We're going to come back to Zechariah. I just wanted you to practice finally. But look at Matthew 24. We're going to read all of Zechariah, but I just want to show you this opener because I learned, um, I learned something when I was over in Japan so interesting. Well, a little bit in Korea, but really in Japan. We were ministering to first-generation Christians. These are right, I mean, they just came from bowing down to the little Shinto shrines and all that stuff, and they got saved. And so when I would say, well, you know, it says in Matthew 24, they go, you know, well, they don't really do that. They go, because they're not real overt. They're very quiet people. The Japanese people are very quiet, but they would, they would go like this, and they'd say, wait. I say, what? They said, we want to see. I said, okay. So Matthew 24, 2. So I don't assume you know what it says. It says, and Jesus said to them, do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say unto you, not one stone will be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. Verse 1, Jesus went out, departed from the temple. His disciples came to show him the buildings of the temple. Now look at verse 3. He sat on the Mount of Olives. Christ's very first words in Matthew 24, 2. All that he says about his second coming is introduced by those words. He said, keep your eye on Jerusalem. He said, I am ascending from the Mount of Olives. That's the center of Jerusalem then, and it still is. And I'm returning to the Mount of Olives. See, Jesus centered all of his teaching about the future on Jerusalem. He said, this is a focal point. And, and he wasn't allegorizing. Because remember, the first way to understand the scripture is what was his intended message to the people he talked to? What did they think he was talking about? Did they think he was talking about Rome or the city of God or the church or something? No. He is talking about the Mount of Olives. They were sitting on it. He is talking about Jerusalem, the temple there. And when Jesus says, and there's going to be a temple there at the end, and there's going to be an abomination that Daniel talked about set up there, he's talking about a literal event. And so that's why Jerusalem is so important. Jerusalem is mentioned over 800 times in God's Word. 814 times the word Jerusalem occurs in the Bible in 766 verses. If you add to that all the time Jerusalem is alluded to by the word Zion and also the city of David, you get 206 more. There's also Salem, which is mentioned, uh, the first mention of Jerusalem, Salem, which is Melchizedek's city. So Jerusalem is a very important place. It's in Jerusalem God promised Christ's coming as the Lamb of God to Abraham. This is way back in the Old Testament in Genesis 22 on Mount Moriah. That's when God promised Jesus was coming and God would provide a lamb. And that's what John the Baptist pointed to Christ and said he was the one. So Jerusalem is where Christ's coming was first promised, way back in Genesis. It was here in Jerusalem, David was promised a future son that would have an endless kingdom. That's why Jesus is called, in Matthew, he's called, in, in the promised one, he's called the son of David. Uh, Matthew is talking about Christ's royalty, his right to rule. And he's called the son. He's the future son that David was promised. And he is going to have an endless kingdom. 
and he is going to rule over the house of David. And, and that's why we believe in the millennium. That's when Christ rules. That's what Psalm 2 is about. When did Jesus rule with a rod of iron? And when did he shatter? Not during, I mean, he might have broken a few things during his cleaning the temple. He certainly, he had a cord of whips, not a rod of iron. Psalm 2 is talking about his millennial rule. And it was here in Jerusalem, God has, has worked the work of redemption. And that's probably why Jerusalem is the most important city that there ever has been. It's there that the one sacrifice forever that is not only liberating us from the penalty of sin. Sometimes all we think about is that. That sacrifice also liberated the universe. And, and Romans 8 says, will in the future cause the whole universe to be liberated from what we know in the laws of physics is the you know, entropy and, and heat exhaustion. The whole thing of everything is winding down to this black hole stuff, you know, where, where it's just going to be nothing. That is going to end. See, that's what, you know, when you think we have all these laws of science, well, when sin is finished, all those laws that are about decay and about, you know, heat death are going to end because it's going to, we're going to be liberated, it says, and so you can read that in Romans 8. Romans 8 is an amazing chapter when it talks about that the whole universe is groaning, waiting for the, the promise of redemption. This is the inanimate physical universe is captivated right now by sin. That's why, you know, things are exploding and things are, are decaying and, and the sun is exhausting its thermonuclear store. When you think of Jerusalem, and this is just one poet writing it, Jerusalem is huge if you step back. And if you've never done a study of Jerusalem, it, you know, maybe next time you read the Bible through, look for all 800 of them. But Jerusalem, 3,000 years of lifetimes, Abraham and Isaac upon the altar of Moriah. Did you know that Moriah, where Abraham offered Isaac on the altar, that's in Jerusalem? It's the same ridge of rock that the temple's on today. It's been cut by the, the quarries, but it's the very same ridge of rock that goes from Mount Moriah down to the Temple Mount, down to the city of David. It's, it's one slope of rock, and it's been notched like this. They cut this part out, but this would be Calvary. Uh, now, Jesus' cross wasn't up there, but the hymn, There is a Green Hill Far Away, says it was. Actually, Jesus was crucified down on the road level, but they've notched the Mount Moriah where Abraham offered Isaac. They've cut that and quarried rock that they used to build this up and build the, the Temple Mount platform. They basically moved it to there. But Abraham, in the same spot, this is Jerusalem, this is the city of David, the first Jerusalem, and this is Mount Moriah where, um, where Abraham offered Isaac. It's just a stone's throw from here to here to here. It's a very small area. Uh, this is only, this area here is only 40 acres, the Temple Mount, very small area. Um, David, the shepherd king, watching Bathsheba down here in the city of David. He was looking over his uh, balcony, watching Bathsheba from a distance. Jeremiah was thrown in a pit right here, in, in a pit right here uh, in the city of David. Uh, mourning for the exiles. Jesus taught up here on this platform. This is the platform of the temple that was cut and notched from right there. Jesus taught there in the temple. Peter betrayed Christ. Uh, I mean, denied him, betraying his trust in him. Jesus walked the way of sorrows right there in Jerusalem. He died with forgiveness on his lips, and it's in the same spot Right here in the, the Temple Mount area, especially on these southern steps that go down to the city of David, this is where Pentecost was. Um, that's the only place that you could get 3,000 people uh, that, that would hear that there, there aren't stadiums there. But that was such a large area, the southern steps area, that Peter was shouting the good news uh, in the streets there, the people streaming up into the temple on the day of Pentecost. He was saying, He is risen. 
call in his name and live forever with him. And all of that redemptive history and a whole bunch more is all tied up in Jerusalem. Um, what's interesting is all that's left of Christ Jerusalem is the Western Wall. The, I mean, that's visible uh, just out in the open. All that's left from Christ Jerusalem is called the Western Wall. If you go there, one of the first things you notice are several large signs. In fact, you can't miss them. They're 10 feet tall. And they've been put up there by the Jews. And this is to understand what Jerusalem means to the Jews. This, this is uh, typed out what those signs say. Jewish tradition teaches the Temple Mount is the focal point of creation. Now, these are unsaved Jewish people. These are the same Jews that were following the same religion that Christ was preaching the gospel to and the apostles. But this is what they believe. In the center of the mountain of Jerusalem lies the foundation stone of the world. Believe it or not, the Roman Catholics believe this too. Did you know that? Any of you good former Catholics? They believe that Adam, the Catholics and the Jews believe that underneath the city of Jerusalem, Adam was buried, the cross was right here, and the blood from the cross went down through cracks and touched Adam. That's Roman Catholic theology. Interesting. So they have a little correspondence with the, uh, and you can see all that today. There's a, a, a monument to it um, in uh, the Church of the uh, Holy Sepulchre. But they say that Adam, uh, the foundation stone of the world is there. Adam came into being. They feel the Garden of Eden is actually in Israel. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob served God. They never write out the full name of God. That's how you can always tell that they're Orthodox, observant Jews, because they're not supposed to misuse the Lord's name, so they never spell it. The first and second temples were built on that mountain, Mount Moriah. The Ark of the Covenant was set on the foundation stone of the world. They believe that is where right now the Temple Mount platform, which you would know as the Dome of the Rock. The Jews believe that the Ark of the Covenant was set upon that foundation stone. That's why they are so excited about it. Jerusalem was chosen by God, that's true, as a dwelling place of the divine presence, that's true, the Shekinah. David longed to build the temple, that's true. Solomon, his son, built the first temple here about 3,000 years ago, that's true. See, this part we're, we're not sure. Um, creation and Adam and everything, but this stuff is all true on their sign. Nebuchadnezzar destroyed it in 586, that's true. The second temple was rebuilt on its ruins 70 years later, that's true. That's Zerubbabel, that's what Haggai was writing about to rebuild the temple. Um, let's see, it was raised by the Roman legions over 1900 years ago, that's true, uh, in AD 70. The present western wall before you is a remnant of the western temple mount retaining wall. Jews have prayed in its shadow for hundreds of years, that's very true, an expression of their faith in the rebuilding of the temple. The sages said about it, the divine presence never moves from the western wall. I mean, you know, that's their lore. Uh, the divine presence is, God is omnipresent, but that's fine. The Temple Mount continues to be the focus of prayers for Jews all over the world, but I thought that's very interesting to give you an idea of what they believe. There are three reasons why Jerusalem is vital. It's because Jerusalem is God's city. I already showed you that. He said, it's my city, I chose it. Th tonight, we're going to look at this, and then next month, we're going to see another element which I think is fascinating. Most people never understand that God has used Jerusalem as the backdrop for all of his major, uh, beautiful, revelatory events. But tonight, it's God's city because God chose Jerusalem. 1 Kings 11.36, Unto his son I will give one tribe, and that David, my servant, may have a light always before me in Jerusalem, the city which I have chosen, uh, me, I have chosen to put, I have chosen to put my name there. Sorry, I cut and pasted some extra words. Here's another one, Psalm 48. Great is the Lord, greatly to be praised in the city of our God, the mountain of his holiness. This is a, another word for Jerusalem. It's called the city of our God. Beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth, is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. So what they're saying is that the Lord is so associated with Jerusalem. Then it says in uh, verse 12 of Psalm 48, walk about Zion. Now they're talking about literal earthly Mount Zion. 
uh, which is in Jerusalem. Go around about her, tell the towers, mark her bulwarks, consider her palaces, that you may tell it to the generations following. David is extolling uh, the correspondence between the earthly and the heavenly. Uh, and then Psalm 87, this is fascinating. The Lord loves the gates of Zion. That's the city of Jerusalem, the gates into it. More than all the other dwelling places of Jacob, glorious things of thee are spoken uh, of you, O city of God. And so this, this reminds us, and I could just go on and on and show you, that God's city, God has chosen Jerusalem, and it's very important to him. But the last thing before we go tonight, Jerusalem is God's clock. It's like the countdown clock. It's like, uh, you know, so many movies have the atomic bomb ready to blow, and there's a little countdown. It's getting closer and closer, and finally the hero snips the cable and it stops. The problem is Jerusalem's clock is counting down, and no one can snip the cable. And this is what God says. The close of world history is tied to this little city called Jerusalem. All the world, and I'll show you in just a minute, will focus on Jerusalem as the wrath of God is poured out in the tribulation. How tied Jerusalem is to tribulation is amazing. Fallen human history culminates with Christ's descent to the Mount of Olives, which is in Jerusalem. And the Creator returns to Jerusalem to restore his fallen paradise. Do you understand the millennium is a partial return to paradise? There, there are no carnivorous animals. There are no poisonous snakes or spiders. There is no war. It's, it's a partial return. It's like a, a partial remo removal of the curse. And so much, this fallen paradise or the millennium makes up the promises in the Old Testament make up about 10% of the Old Testament are about this time when the whole world is coming to Jerusalem, when they're worshiping, when the whole world happens to get onto God's schedule. And I'll show you that in just a moment uh, in Zechariah. Here's Zechariah. You can follow along in your Bible. It's way too small for you to look at. This is all of chapter 12, okay? I just wanted to point out to you, the reason I put it up here is when Zechariah is sitting in Jerusalem, he couldn't believe that God was talking about where he was. Um, it's just amazing to think that he's sitting there in his little apartment in the old city of Jerusalem writing this manuscript. And as you read this, it says, the burden of the word of the Lord against Israel. So Zechariah, the prophet, post-exilic prophet in the 6th century is writing this. Thus says the Lord, and this is fascinating here. Um, what, what he describes the Lord as. The Lord who stretches out the heavens. This is the cosmos. This, this is how God describes creation, which might answer a lot of people's questions about did the light from that, that our super you know, Hubble telescope is detecting. Did that light begin 14 billion years ago and make its way across the universe to get to the Hubble telescope for 14 billion, whatever it is, 13, whatever number they have these days? Or did God stretch out the heavens? And if he did so, where did he stretch them from? Well, what he said is, he stretched, God, his reference point of creation is the earth, where we are right now. And it says, he is the God who stretches out the heavens, the cosmos, from the earth outward. And so that would explain how we could have light from 14 whatever billion years ago and the earth not be that old because he stretched it out, the equivalent of 14 billion light years in one direction. Uh, second thing, this is the geos. This is, you know, uh, the, the cosmos is the universe. The earth is the geos. He laid the foundation of the earth. And we know so little about our own planet. We, we can't penetrate more than seven miles or well, I don't know how deep they've drilled, but not very deep. We have all kinds of echo thoughts 
But just the study of the, the you know, geodesy, the balance of the continents and the water and, and all the other elements of, of, the uni- of just the earth are just incomprehensible. But the Lord made the cosmos, he made the geos. And then there's a word right here. This is the pneumos. This is the, and, and I'm just saying, if you read the translation in Greek, you pick up He's the one that stretched out the cosmos. He's the one that laid the foundation of the geos, the earth. And he's the one that put the pneumos, the spirit, within man. So that's who's talking. Who else has that calling card? Who else can say, I have made the universe. I happen to have created the earth with all of its intricacies and laid the foundation. And by the way, I made you too. And that's who's talking to you, Zechariah. And I'm sure he sharpened his pen, you know, or pencil. And... And the Lord says, this is what I want you to write down. Verse 2. Behold, I am going to make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding people. What's a cup of drunkenness? It's where someone keeps drinking and they don't even know that that they're harming themselves. I mean, read God's philosophy of drinking sometime in Proverbs. He says that it's a person who who sits on top of a mast and doesn't know that they're in danger. It's someone who has wounds and they don't know where they came from because they are so drunken that they are doing things they shouldn't be doing. That's what Jerusalem's going to become. People are going to be drunken. All the surrounding people around Israel are going to be not literally drinking alcohol, though they might, but Muslims don't. But they're going to be so intoxicated with getting Jerusalem that they're going to lay siege on Jerusalem. They're going to finally say, we're going to get that city. We're going to have it at last. It's always been a contention point. And it shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem, look at what God says, Jerusalem's going to become a very heavy stone for all peoples, I'm sure right about now, Zechariah is going like this. And he goes, who even knows we're here? We're nobodies in the backwoods. He said Jerusalem is going to become all all the nations of the earth are going to be gathered against it. It doesn't say all the nations that are in Mesopotamia or in the, you know, Middle East. It says the whole Geos, the whole earth, is going to be united. If you think people don't like Israel now, just wait. It's going to be universally hated by everybody on earth. Everybody's going to send their sons to join the army to go destroy Israel. And that day, the Lord says, the Lord gets involved. I'm going to strike every horse with confusion, every rider with madness. I will open my eyes in the house of Judah. I will strike every horse of the people with blindness. And the governors of Judah will say in their heart, the inhabitants of Jerusalem are my strength, the Lord of hosts of God. And that day I'll make the governors of Judah like a fire pan and a wood pile, a fiery torch. They will devour the surrounding peoples in the right hand and the left, but Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place. The Lord, verse 7, will save the tents of Judah first, and the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants will not become greater than Judah. And that day, look at this, the Lord will defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. The one who is feeble among that day will be like David. We only have two minutes left. Do you know anything about David? As far as we know, David never lost a single battle, and David was never even wounded once. He fought hand-to-hand combat. He had to be this close to people. He killed them with his sword, it says. In fact, the reason God wouldn't let him build the temple is he said he was a bloody man. Literally, David would come back from his hackathons covered with gore. That's the only way you kill people with a sword. You slash and you cut and stuff spills. It says the, the feeble, the most feeble person in the last days in the Jews, the feeblest one is going to be like David, who never got wounded and never lost a battle. And the house of David will be like God, the, the angel of the Lord. What was the angel of the Lord like? One time the angel of the Lord struck just one boom and killed 180,000 Assyrian soldiers. Angel of the Lord's pretty powerful. See, these euphemisms or these metaphors, these, these pictures are powerful. And then here's the good part, and it's time to go. I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem. So see, everyone gets saved the same way. You know, when it says in, in 
Romans 9, 10, and 11 that all Israel will be saved? They're saved the same way we do. God initiates. He pours out at this climactic moment. Do you remember I told you that two-thirds of Jerusalem are, if, if you read the rest, are destroyed. They're coming in. They're pillaging, plundering, raping, and murdering and all the armies, and only the remnant, only the third is left. And the Lord on them pours out his spirit of grace and supplication. And in that instant, they look on me. Wait a minute. Who's talking here? The word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord. They will look on me, whom they pierced. I'll never forget doing what I just did with you, with a Jewish man flying on LL, who was so enchanted. He was a rabbi, had the full beard and all the stuff, you know, and the, all the tassels and everything. And, he was eating his sandwich, and he says, how come you're reading the Old Testament? I said, can I show you what I just found? And I did this. I said, I was just reading this. I said, look at this verse. I said, you can read English, can't you? And I will pour out on this house of David. He said, that's our Tanakh. I said, yeah, it sure is. It's the prophet Zechariah. On the inhabitants of Jerusalem, yay, Jerusalem. He was all excited, chewing faster. The spirit of grace and supplication, and they will look on me. And I just drew a line. I said, who's talking there? The Lord, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, God, me, whom they pierced. I said, when did God get pierced? He shoved his sandwich in and walked away. Wouldn't talk anymore. You see, it's so clear what the Lord's going to do. And gonna... I want to pick up in Zechariah 12, verses 8 through 14. I want to show you what the Lord says about why his attention is on Jerusalem and, and what is going on there. Uh, the first thing it says is that there is a period of time when the Lord is going to defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Has that happened? Not for a long time. The, the last significant time that God defended Jerusalem was when Hezekiah was the king and 180,000 Assyrian troops were just a bow shot out. I mean, they stayed so they, they couldn't be shot with arrows, but however far you can shoot a normal bow, not one of these new, you know, compound complex ones, but just a normal one, that's how far away the 180,000 were. They were breathing down the necks of the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And Hezekiah ran to Isaiah and got on his knees and spread out the letter and prayed, and the Lord says, don't worry, leave your letter here with me go to bed. And when he went to bed, King Hezekiah, the angel of the Lord went to the camp, killed every soldier, 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. And when Hezekiah got up in the morning and walked, and by the way, in Jerusalem, you can still see the wall he built where he stood. They've dug down 30 feet under the city to show you Hezekiah's wall, it's called. And he stood there and he looked up you know, he was waiting to see those beady eyes and their bows all cocked, ready to shoot. And there wasn't a sound. And they sent someone out. Every, a fifth of a million corpses were out there. God says, I'm going to get back into the defending Jerusalem mode. And, and he said, uh, it's going to be that, that the weakest, and I covered this last week, but if you haven't thought about it, the, the most feeble soldier will be like David. What do we know about David? David never lost a battle. David could kill the biggest armed opponent, Goliath, with one rock, a little one, and a slingshot, no armor. What it's, God says, you plus me make a majority. You're a winner if you're on my side, if you're following me. And so it shall be on that day I will seek, the Lord says, God is speaking, I will destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. Has that ever happened? Have all the nations ever come against Jerusalem? No. In fact, Psalm 83, if you ever want to read it, lists off the nations that are going to be in this confederacy, and it lists off a group of nations that have never collectively ever come against Israel. They all at different times did never together. And basically it talks about the Tyre in the north, which would be modern-day Lebanon. It talks about Damascus and the Arameans, which would be modern-day 
Syria. It talks about the desert people, which, and it names them all, which would be Saudi Arabia and, you know, Jordan and that whole area. Then it talks about Assyria, which would be, you know, what is modern day uh, Iran and Persia, which became out of the Assyrian Empire. And, of course, the far north, which would be Russia. All of those nations, different nations that come against Jerusalem, God says, I'm going to seek to destroy the description of that, if you ever want to read it, is in Ezekiel 38 and 39. And it says God sends down hail and sends earthquakes and defeats them completely. But look what he's doing. This links together. Zechariah 12 and verse 10 explains to us one thing that is a great mystery if you're reading the New Testament. In Romans, uh, Romans 9 through 11, those chapters, 9 through 11 of Romans, talk about God's sovereign election of Israel. And, and that's why covenant theologians try and make Israel become the church, and so God sovereignly elects the church. Well, he does. But he's also made an unbreakable eternal covenant with Israel. They don't want God to break his covenant with us. Well, then don't want him to break it with them, and they can't break it. It's a, it's a one-sided covenant. He swears by himself so that nobody can break it. But this is the event. This is the sovereign election of, of Israel. I will, pour out, uh, I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Now, people have real trouble with this. The spirit of grace and supplication. Why would God pour on those hard-hearted, proud Jewish Christ killers his spirit? Well, why did he pour out his spirit of grace and supplication on me? I'm as hard-hearted and just as equally as guilty of killing Christ because my sins, he was, God treated Christ like he committed every sin I committed. That's what justification means. That's what the substitutionary atonement means. It's just they're equally sinful, equally as all of us are, uh, and God chooses to pour out his spirit of grace and supplication and look at what happens. The nation of Israel will look on me whom they pierce. Now, I'm going to qualify that when we get to the next chapter. It's fascinating. A lot of them don't survive. Only the remnant. Not, when all Israel gets saved, it's all the remnant elected by God gets saved. Two-thirds of them are killed by these nations coming around them, and we'll read that. But look what happens. Remember how Jesus said, Blessed are those that mourn, for they shall be comforted. He's not talking about people that are feeling bad about their team losing. He's talking about what I was telling Alice at the Evergreen North. I said, Alice, when you, the 93-year-old Roman Catholic, I said, Alice, when you are desperately grieving for your total inability to ever be good enough for God. See, you have to get someone lost before they get saved. God doesn't say, oh, come to me all polished up and, you know, I don't have to do much work. God says, come to me when you are hopelessly lost. Come to me as a beggar. Blessed are the poor in spirit, Jesus said. Poor in spirit. There are three types of poor people in the ancient world. Uh, well, they, they would describe people's poverty in three ways. There were those who only had enough for a little while. There were those who only had enough for one day. The little while would be what we'd call the middle class. You know, you can be unemployed for a few months or a few weeks, and then you're in trouble. The one day are kind of like the rescue mission types. You know, they just have enough for that day. The, the, the ones Jesus says that mourn are the ones that don't even have anything for today. They're the ones that are absolutely destitute. They're starving. Jesus said, when you mourn as one mourns for his only son, when you grieve because your sins are on Christ, as one grieves for losing their firstborn, and that day there'll be a great mourning in Jerusalem, like the mourning at Hadad Rimmim in the plains of Megiddo, and the land shall mourn, and every family. And, and what it's saying is the Spirit of God makes people so conscious of their sin, they start mourning and weeping and wailing. And then, well, now that's chapter 14. So now go to 13 in your Bible. I didn't have time to slip that in. So now you get to use your Bible. Look at Zechariah. That's just, just go to Matthew and back up if you're not there already. And it's just one book uh, behind Malachi. But look at chapter 13. It enlarges on this. It says, In that day a fountain shall be opened for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Now look up from your Bibles for a second. Guess what? That means 
on the day of Christ's second coming, that's the day we're talking about, Jerusalem is still standing. You know, one of the questions at the Holy Land meeting just now, they said, you know, with all the unrest over there, is it really safe to go? I said, well, actually, it's the safest place to go. It's the only spot we're sure is going to survive if there is a nuclear holocaust. Jerusalem is standing inhabited with people when the second coming. When Christ comes to the Mount of Olives, he's not coming to a, you know, a melted wasteland that has been nuked or germ warfared or anything. Jerusalem is standing and inhabited. And so in that day, a fountain shall be open. And that's speaking of the, the merciful, wonderful, merciful Savior in his gracious offering. Verse 2, in that day, the Lord of hosts, I will cut off the names of the idols. There's just this cleansing of the land. Um, verse 4, in that day, every prophet will be ashamed because all these, these people purporting uh, to, you know, the singer Madonna goes to Israel and she's a part of this uh, up in Safed, uh, this, this movement of false teaching, all that. The Lord's going to silence that. These people are going to mourn. They're going to repent. They're going to believe the truth. But look at verse 7. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who is my companion, says the Lord. Strike the shepherd. The sheep will be scattered. And I will turn my hand against the little ones. And, and you remember that's quoted uh, in the Passion of Christ uh, his last week because he was the shepherd that was struck. But, but here's what I was telling you. Look at verse 8. And it should come to pass in all that land, says the Lord, that two-thirds of it shall be cut off and die, but one-third shall be left in it. The, what happens is Jerusalem is encircled. If this is Jerusalem, the armies of the world encircle Jerusalem and all the people of Judah flee into the city, and they're there. And uh, if, if you read, it's really awful uh, what happens. It talks about them, um, in, and we'll get to that, that they are, they are ravishing the people. They are killing the people. They are raping and murdering. It's just hor all of these armies, as always happens. But the people flee into Jerusalem, chapter 13 says, but what happens is that the Lord allows two-thirds of them to be cut off and only the remnant, one-third, remain. And when that one-third remains, they're the ones that we're going to see uh, cry out to the Lord. And it says, verse 9, I will bring one-third through the fire. I'll refine them as silver is refined, test them as gold. They will call on my name. How did Paul share the gospel? What does it say in Romans 10, 13? For whosoever shall what? Call. Now, it's from Joel, but it's the same concept. Whoever calls. And what he says here is, is they will call on my name. Kind of like I told that lady. I said, when you can, with, with such consciousness of your sin, after 93 years of good works, when you realize you never can save yourself, and you just reach out and say, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. That's what this is talking about. They will call on my name. They'll say, be merciful to me. We're sinners. We don't deserve your, your attention. And I will answer them, and I will say, this is my people. And each one will say, the Lord is my God. That is Romans 9, 10, and 11, the Israel, all Israel being saved. That is the remnant, the one-third that calls on the Lord. Now, Chapter 14 um, is what's on the screen, and I really want to finish this with you. Um, it's a beautiful, come on, there we go. Um, chapter 14 says, Behold the day of the Lord. Now remember, this, this is the, the day of the Lord speaks of the time surrounding the second coming of Christ. And, and specifically, the day of the Lord is what it says in 2 Thessalonians 1.7. When, when Christ comes in fiery indignation, consuming his enemies. He is coming. In fact, prior to this event, he has come from Armageddon. And the Lord swoops down. He doesn't touch the ground. It says that all the armies are up at Armageddon, which is in the north of Israel. They're all there to fight against the Lord. Can you believe it? They're going to fight against. I mean, that's how the Antichrist has them all lathered up, and they think they're going to 
they killed him once, they'll kill him again. You know, they're gonna, Satan's got them going like that, and they're all there with you know, their guns or whatever they have. And it says all of a sudden the Lord comes, and it says he comes with all the hosts of heaven. Do you remember when we were studying the throne room of the universe, how many angels there are? There are uncountable angels. There are billions of angels. And they all leave heaven. All the hosts. Jehovah Sabaoth, Yahweh Sabaoth means the Lord of the armies. Can you imagine, you know, they're up there at Megiddo and they've got their sights on and their satellite, whatever, and they're looking and all of a sudden you see a little speck and the speck grows until you see it's fanning out, kind of like a flock of geese. You know how they have the point? The point is Christ on that white horse. But as it fans out, they just start realizing, I mean, we're talking about more than anybody can count. And they're flying on horses. I wonder if the missiles, heat seekers will even go there. So that's the day of the Lord coming. And I will gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem. See, this is why, and again, I, I mentioned this morning, why Calvary Bible Church believes in a distinction between Israel and the churches. The covenant theologians would say, this happened in A.D. 70. The problem is, what nations came against Israel in A.D. 70? The Roman Empire. Not every country on earth. Not every nation on the planet. Actually, only one main legion, the Ninth Legion, and a few others were 6,000 troops encircled Jerusalem, built a wall, and starved them to death until they were bloated and dying. And then when they had no strength to even lift their arm, they went in and just massacred them all. That isn't this event. All the nations, and, and they're all surrounding Jerusalem. The city is taken. Now look at this. The houses are rifled. The, the conquest of Jerusalem at the day of the Lord is pretty one-sided. All the nations are there. They're coming around. The Lord is busy up at Megiddo. They've taken the city. They're, they're progressively coming in, house by house going through, ravishing the women, dragging people off into captivity. The remnant, this one-third group, is still in the city clinging to hope, weeping over their sin, realizing they're the ones that crucified Christ. And as they're, they're just thinking it's too late and, and the armies are coming in to ravish and kill them, then the Lord, in verse 3, this is the second coming, the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. And on that day, his feet stand on the Mount of Olives. I mean, can you imagine being in Jerusalem being a Jew that formerly was smug and proud and thought you knew it all and were against those zany Christians, and all of a sudden the spirit of grace and supplication comes on you, and just like you and I, the moment we were convicted of our sin, we realized we were lost, we were hopeless, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, and that he in his mercy and grace offers us a free gift, and it just, you know, to whom much is forgiven, the same loves much, and, and you're so overwhelmed at that, that you're just so sorry for how you've lived and so thankful for what he did. All that's going on in the city when all of a sudden they hear a boom. And the God of the universe that created everything stands on the Mount of Olives. Can you imagine being a soldier, killing the chosen people of promise when God starts walking toward you? Unbelievable. He fights those nations. He fights in the day of battle. His feet stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem from the east. And as he lands on it, the Mount of Olives shall split in two from east to west, makes a big valley. Half the mountain moves toward the north, the other half toward the south. And you will flee through my mountain valley. The mountain valley shall reach um, Azal. Yes, you shall flee as you fled from the earthquake and a historic event, King Uzziah in the 8th century B.C., Thus the Lord will come, and look at this. Now we have the rapture proven, too, in the Old Testament. The saints come with him. He doesn't come and get them. They're already with him. See, it's, if you just take the Bible for what it says, 
This is the oldest prophecy in the Bible. Enoch, if you read in the book of Jude, the earliest prophecy is, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on the ungodly for all the ungodly deeds which ungodly men have committed in their ungodliness. It says ungodly four times. That's what God thinks of sinners. Enoch says that the Lord comes at the second coming with his saints with him. What is that? Well, if you look at the difference between the first coming of Christ, uh, he, he came as a baby and he left from the Mount of Olives. I, I mentioned that already. And here he is on the Mount of Olives and he's ascending to heaven after his first coming. And you know, the covenant theologians chuckle and say, yeah, they have three comings or two. You know, we lost count of how many comings. Well, it's very, very different. When Jesus ascended to heaven from the Mount of Olives in Acts chapter 1 and Luke chapter 24, it says that he stretched out his arms and began blessing his disciples. The first thing you realize, in fact, I just did that reading in my quiet time this week. It was beautiful to read that only saved people saw him. Jesus was only seen by by loving eyes and touched by loving hands after he rose from the dead. No unsaved person saw him, not one. And he goes up to that Mount of Olives, only surrounded by believers. And as he's standing there, he starts blessing them. And, and you know how all of us feel unworthy if someone starts saying something nice about us and we just kind of, you know, kind of put our head down because we can't believe they're saying such nice things. Can you imagine the Lord saying nice things about you, blessing you? And so he's blessing. He puts his arms out as he blesses them. And as he's blessing them, Luke tells us that he begins to ascend. He starts rising off the ground. But he keeps on. The tense of the verb is he doesn't stop. He keeps on blessing and saying, Peter, Peter, thank you, and you've come back, and you're going to follow shepherd my sheep. Peter, John, oh, I love you. You've been so close to me. Keep going. Oh, Andrew, thanks for bringing people to me. Can you just, I mean, they're all just eating it up. And he's going up, and finally he's out of sight, and they're looking up at him, and they didn't notice. Two more people showed up. Angels are standing there. And so the disciples get done looking up at, at Christ, and then they say, oh, an angel, hi. And the angel said, oh, don't be alarmed. This same Jesus, whom you've seen go into heaven, will so come in like manner. How, how he's going to come back the way he left? Raining down blessing and, oh, I love you, you're wonderful. How come it says in 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 that he's going to come in fiery vengeance, killing his enemies. That sounds like a disconnect. That's because after this, he comes to get his saints in what is called the harpazo. That's the Greek word, harpazo, which means to snatch. And harpazo in Greek was translated by Jerome the one who wrote the Roman Catholic Vulgate, if you've ever heard of the, you know, the Latin Bible, the Vulgate, and when he translated the Greek word harpazo into Latin, do you know what the Greek word harpazo in Latin is? It's the Greek word rapturos. You ever heard of someone say they're just enraptured by the music? What that means is they're just taken away by it. Harpazo means to be literally snatched. When, when Philip witness to the Ethiopian eunuch and led him to Christ. It says the Spirit of God snatched him from the Ethiopian eunuch and deposited him in Caesarea. He takes him to a different place. He scoops him up. People say, what is the rapture? Never heard of the rapture. God's been rapturing people. He raptured Philip from one spot to another. He raptured Elijah right out, and so Enoch. I mean, he's very good at rapturing. And that is the Greek word harpazo, and that's how the saints get with him because he has come down in like manner. He comes down blessing, and the ultimate blessing is to have Christ come, and in the moment, in the twinkling of the eye, change us and give us our, our resurrection bodies, and we meet him in the clouds. That is what he promised. That is all his first coming and rapture for his church. 
so they get with him so that they can come with him as part of his hosts as he out front is doing what we're going to read about. And it shall come a pass in that day. Watch what happens here in chapter 14, verse 6. In that day that there will be no light, the lights will diminish. All of a sudden, already in chapter 18 of Revelation, the electricity has gone off. I wonder how they're going to do everything because it says all the electricity goes off, all the music stops in Revelation 18 just for the second coming. Can you imagine what's going to happen to a group of people when their iPod stops working and their iPhone doesn't work and they can't stream their videos? All of a sudden the games freeze and there's going to be a whole generation that will just go, they don't know how to do. And the Lord turns off all the music, all the electricity goes off, it's, it, and it goes into this kind of twilight zone where, where it's unnatural light. And it shall be one day which is known to the Lord that it's neither day or night. It's kind of like the whole world is in twilight. And evening time it shall happen that it will be light. And in that day it shall be that living waters will flow from Jerusalem. Now that's because Christ's feet hit the Mount of Olives and it goes north and south. And when it goes north and south, it opens a channel between the the goes to the Mediterranean, goes to the Dead Sea, and look what happens. Living waters flow from Jerusalem, half of them toward the Eastern Sea, which would, we would call the Dead Sea. That's the Eastern Sea, and half of them toward the Med. You see, it's uh, geographic, and that's what Bible geography helps you with. In the summer and winter, it shall occur. So this fountain starts flowing, and it doesn't stop. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth, and that day the Lord is one, and that's his name. And the land shall be turned into a plain. There's a geographic change in, in the topography. And uh, Jerusalem's raised up like it becomes higher. Uh, see, the millennium, there's a, there's a total change. We're, we're going from life as we know it toward the kingdom age. And there's going to be uh, geographical changes. But the people shall dwell in it, verse 11, no longer shall there be utter destruction. It's like the Lord... Now, a lot's happening that isn't described here that Jesus tells about in Matthew 25, the judgment of the nations and all that. But Jerusalem will be safely inhabited. And look, did you wonder what happened to the soldiers? Remember I told you they're right in the middle of raping this woman and they're ravishing this one and they're breaking in the house and murdering that one. And all of a sudden someone says, look at that. And it's like a fireball is coming down because it says Jesus comes in flaming fire. And he's coming down, surrounded by fire, to the top of the Mount of Olives. And look what he does. This sounds just like a neutron bomb. By the way, the Jews invented that too. It shall be, this is the plague which the Lord will strike all the people who fought against Jerusalem. So all these soldiers of all the earth, their flesh shall dissolve. While they stand on their feet, their eyes shall dissolve. Amazing in their sockets, their tongues, that they were cursing, that they were murderously terrorizing, killing two-thirds of the Jews, helpless, a second holocaust. And their flesh just, just drains away, their eyes melt, their tongues dissolve in their mouths. The Lord says, don't tangle with me. Um, and it shall come to pass that day a great panic from the Lord. And that is understatement, I would say. Uh, and everyone will seize the hand of his neighbor and raise his hand against his neighbor's hand. And Judah will fight at Jerusalem. And the wealth of all the surrounding nations will be gathered together. All of that. Such shall be the plague on the horse and the mule, the camel and the donkey. This is verse 15. On the cattle, so shall the plague be. And it shall come to pass that everyone who is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year. They're actually people that the Lord allows to survive. He doesn't kill everybody. People have to populate the millennium. And there, there are people that it must be just like nowadays that there are people in the army that are there because they're supposed to, but they're not doing any of those bad things. They're not, you know, when I was, you know, when I was in high school, it was the My Lai massacre with whatever his name was that killed all the poor Vietnamese that were unarmed because he went berserk. There are probably people that are in this army that the Antichrist threatened with death if they didn't come and march on Jerusalem, and the Lord knows that. 
And so he melts and dissolves and kills and destroys all the ones who came there hateful and murderous and vengeance and hating God and melts them. But these people of all the nations which came against Jerusalem, they don't get dissolved. But look what happens. This is when, now we're blurring from the second coming. It goes uh, seven-year tribulation right here. The Antichrist starts it right there. At the midpoint, he breaks the covenant. This event we've been reading is at the end of the seven years, so there's three and a half years. And I didn't pick those numbers. God did. Remember, we saw that this morning in, in uh, Daniel 9, 24 to 27. It says, in the midpoint of the last week, which is seven years, the tribulation, the tribulation lasts seven years. The Antichrist starts the tribulation making this covenant with Israel and letting them have their temple. He breaks it, and this becomes the fearsome, horrible part. Right at the end, the Antichrist has all Armageddon that's, in, that's already, you know, ev happening, but other army people are doing all this stuff we're reading down in Jerusalem, Armageddon's way north. The second coming of Christ is right there marking the end of the tribulation. There is a period of time in here called the judgment of the nations that Matthew 26, uh, 41 talks about that, that they're gathered before him, the sheep and the goat, judgment and all that. But then it rolls right into what is known as the millennium. The millennium is not heaven. Look what the millennium is. The people are keeping when God, now this is something for you to think about tonight, when God gets back fully visibly in control, he reinstitutes a lot of his Jewish stuff. I thought Israel was tossed aside. That's why covenant theologians don't like the millennium because they don't know what to do with it because look, it literally says that. After this event, has that event ever happened? Did the Romans melt? No, the Jews melted in A.D. 70. When this event, when this plague happens, when the second coming and Christ comes in fiery judgment, he takes over the world. Jesus sits on the throne of his father David that we sing about every Christmas, you know, and he shall, uh, you know, be on the throne of his father David as the hymn goes. What are they doing? They're keeping the Feast of Tabernacle. And it shall be that whichever the families of the earth don't come to Jerusalem. This is why there are eight chapters in the Bible, Ezekiel 40 to 48. You talk about a hard to be, you know, understand section of the Bible. God describes a massive multi-square mile temple that gets built in Jerusalem. He raises up, we already saw that a couple back here. It says that, that he's raising, let's see, Jerusalem shall be raised up. He makes like this, this tectonic upthrust of, of land, and there's this extra area up there, and they build this, this temple for the Feast of Tabernacles in Jerusalem, and the Lord says, if you don't come up to Jerusalem to this millennial temple I've built to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, I'm not going to let it rain on you. Did you catch that? That's what it means in Psalm 2 when it says he rules with a rod of iron. He says, you aren't going to come up to Jerusalem? It won't rain on your crops, on your vines, on your food. You are going to be hungry if you don't come up. And what the Lord is doing is, for 1,000 years, there are no poisonous snakes, yay, no poisonous spiders, yay, and no carnivorous animals, no pit bulls attacking people, no lions and or killer whales and sharks. Everything goes back and the curse is not removed, it's just pulled back and restrained. So probably weeds won't grow, you know, as fast, if at all. But during this time, the Lord says, use your free time, you don't have to weed your garden anymore, come and learn about me in Jerusalem. For a thousand years, did you know what the Bible says? You, you don't die during the millennium unless you're a rebel. That's what it says in Isaiah. It says, if a rebel dies at the age of 100, people will think he's but a child, because everyone will become like like the, the pre-flood world where you 
regularly live to be a thousand years old. And they're coming to Jerusalem. They're seeing the Lord. The family of Egypt will, will not come up and enter in. They shall have no rain. They shall receive the plague with which the Lord strikes the nations who don't come up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Every year they're all supposed to come up and learn about the Lord. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all the nations that don't come up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. What does that mean? You understand? People that don't that are unwilling to interpret the Bible to mean what it says, what does that mean? If you don't go to church, the Lord won't let your sprinklers work? I mean, what does it mean if it doesn't mean what it says? See, as soon as you detach meaning from plain sense, you can make it mean anything. That's what a lot of wackos and cults do. The Bible means what it says. The Lord is going to rule with a rod of iron. He promised that in Psalm 2. He's going to invite the whole world to come through this massive, multi-square-mile temple. It's 25,000 uh, it gives the, the measurements of it in Ezekiel 40 48. In that day, holiness of the Lord will be engraved on the bells of the horses. The pots of the Lord's house will be like the bowls before the altar. Yes, every pot in Jerusalem and Judah will have holiness of the Lord. Everyone who sacrifices will come and take them, and there will be no longer a Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. What does that mean? No idolatry. No, the Canaanites were known for crude in fact, it's only recently they're, they're publishing the pictures of the excavations of Canaan. When they dug up the Canaanite villages, I'm talking about from the time of the conquest, 3,500 years ago, they were doing sexual things so deviant that archaeologists were embarrassed. Now they're starting to publish them because, you know, that's vogue. But those Canaanites were very evil. And so Jerusalem is God's countdown for human survival. And when Jesus told his disciples about the future, every word of the future was around one spot on earth. And that message, which is in Matthew 24 and 25, and Mark 13 and Luke 21, is called the Olivet Discourse. And Jesus framed the history of the planet by the sight of Jerusalem as the people were, as his disciples were on the Mount of Olives looking at Jerusalem. He said, that's going to be where the end comes. And in Matthew 24, Jesus said, keep your eye on Jerusalem. That's why understanding what God's plans are for Jerusalem is key to fitting together, interpreting correctly God's word. Just real quickly, these aren't very good, but this, this is modern Jerusalem. Do you see the Dome of the Rock right there? Uh, this is looking up uh, from the south, looking up toward the north. You can see it gets higher. Uh, this is Mount Scopus right here, and the Mount of Olives is right there, out of the picture. This is the Kidron Valley going right here, and this, if I can see it well enough, is the Hinnom Valley going like this. And that's the Dome of the Rock, and what is circled right here is the part of Jerusalem that was called Salem in Genesis 14. And that's where... And it was called Jebus during the uh, conquest by Joshua. And it's called Jerusalem, the city of David, throughout the rest of the Bible. But all of this wasn't there, and it was just 12 acres. Just think of 12 acres. A very small area. In fact, David, the city of David was 12 acres. It's very, like a parking lot. You know, I mean, our property here is 18 acres, so just think of two-thirds of... Uh, all of this here is how big Jerusalem was. In the time of Melech Zedek, Melech is the, Greek word, or the Hebrew word for king, and Zedek is the Hebrew word for righteousness. So there was a king called the king of righteousness in a city of Salem, which means peace. And if you don't think there's something going on there, this king, Melchizedek, had neither father nor mother nor beginning of days nor end of days, and he had no descent. So he was an unusual person, some people think it was Shem, you know, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Remember, they survived the flood. So to earthlings, when they got off that boat and they started having grandchildren, they said, where'd you come from? He says, well, I'm from a world you'll never quite understand. I'm from before God destroyed the earth. And they, so they kind of thought, if, if Melchizedek is Shem, it would fit that he didn't have father, mother, beginning of days, nor whatever, because he lived longer than everybody else. He lived 600 years, and you're only living 70. And what's going on? This guy's through 10 generations. So, or it could have been a theophany or a Christophany, or it could have just been a prophet. But that's where he was in Genesis 14. And uh, when we come back next time, because it's time to go, 
we've looked at the prophetic implications. Another beautiful truth is Jerusalem is a canvas. It's kind of like a, a drawing that God has made for us. And in the Word of God, this city has seven beautiful sides. In other words, there's seven events that God chose to have happen in Jerusalem. And one of them is right here. It's, it's this, this city that becomes part of us learning about, in Hebrews chapter 7, Hebrews tells us that Melchizedek was a type of Christ. And, and that Melchizedek is kind of like this king of righteousness in this city of peace. And so we're going to come back and look at that, and we're going to talk about Melchizedek and what all that means. But that's only the first of seven elements that God has given us in the history of this land. But the short of it is this. God has said, I left from Jerusalem, Mount of Olives, blessing. And I left saying, I'm going to go and prepare a place for you, disciples. And if I go and prepare a place, I'm going to come back and get you. And when I come and get you, you're going to come live with me forever. And that was positive. Jesus' second coming is in fiery wrath, blowing and destroying and melting everybody in his path. That second coming should never be confused with the promise he made to come back as a blessing. But he only comes back to those who cry out to him and say, be merciful to me, the sinner. So think about it. If you don't wake up tomorrow morning, will Jesus come and find you and take you through the valley of the shadow of death because you belong to him and he's preparing you a place? Or will you go to Hades, which is still there, and every human that's ever lived on this planet that's never received Christ is conscious, alive, and on earth right now, waiting in torment, for the final judgment. The Lord says, it's appointed unto you once to die. Either you go to the grave and wait judgment or you go to my Father's house where I prepare a place for you. All that he taught us in Jerusalem. Let's stand so we can leave on time. And as we stand, I'd like you to think about the gospel of Jesus Christ. He said, whoever will call on my name, I will save. And those Jews are going to be there with the whole city falling around them, being ravished. And in that moment, they're convicted of their sin. It says they look up and they see him coming. And they say, that's the one that was pierced by our sins. And he saves them. And he saves people the same way today. If you're not lost, you can't be saved. If you're saved, you knew that you were born a sinner and hopeless. And 93 years of Catholicism or anything, Mormon, nothing can get you to God but you cry out to him. I hope if you sat through this for an hour, you caught the message that you have to personally call in the name of the Lord to be saved. Let's, let's go to, uh, since we're in Romans, let's back up to Zechariah 12. Oh, there is a book we haven't been to for a while. Zechariah. It goes Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, Matthew. There you go. So go back from Matthew, uh, a short book, and then go to Zechariah 12. And... Uh, this is the third of four implications, and we'll pick up on the fourth implication next week, which is Christ's view of salvation. But I would like to talk to you about the implications of Christ's views and convictions about prophecy. Listen to this. Jesus believed the Bible is prophetic and that the Bible contains a roadmap of the entire history of the universe from beginning to end. So the ending that Jesus shared that we've been studying in Matthew 24, that ending and the record in Revelation of Revelation 4 through 22, Jesus affirmed that that was true prophetic roadmap for the future. Now, in Zechariah, in just a minute, we're going to look at Zechariah 12, the first three verses. Any ideas about a world without the Jewish nation and without the Jewish people called Israel are not ideas from God, but ideas from the devil. Do you know who wants to get rid of Israel most? Not the Arabs. Not the Muslims. It's the devil. Why? Because God's already written history. And in history, the end of the world is precipitated by Jewish people living in a city called Jerusalem, in a land called Judea, Israel, 
And all the world is so upset, they're all marching on them. That's how the world ends. And so if you are, are wanting to ruin God's plan, get rid of the Jews. Ship them to Angola, as the United Nations says. Move to Africa. Why do you want to be there over in, by the oil country? Just move to Africa. Well, why are they there? Because that's the land. God said, the, the land that I've put my name on, my ownership on, is that little strip, that land bridge between Europe and Asia and Africa. And that little strip of land that was Canaan, I gave to my servant Abraham. And it is forever to be to his descendants. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, named by God Israel. Forever theirs. So, any group that is opposed to the Jews having the land that God gave them are actually in opposition to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But further, any church that teaches Israel has been replaced by the church does not accurately reflect the teaching of God's word. And that church has allowed a false doctrine, one that, by the way, favors Satan's plan, to seep into their theology. In fact, you want to know the most notable person that did that? His name was Martin Luther. I mean, I love him. Can't wait to meet him in heaven. He was totally wrong on that one point. Martin Luther said the church replaces Israel. The Jews are useless. They're Christ killers. Kill them. Read it. He wrote it. He wrote the address to the German nobility. A young man by the name of Adolf Hitler read that pamphlet and decided he would do it. You see, that is not God's plan. God says, as we'll see in a moment in Zechariah, it is clear for anyone who will read God's word that the Jewish people living in unbelief are rescued nationally by their Messiah, Jesus Christ. And in that moment, some will turn in faith and actually be rescued spiritually and be saved. The short story is that there are Jews in Jerusalem and they're the trigger for the end of the world according to the word of God. That's how God said the world ends. Zechariah 12, starting in verse 1. The burden of the word of the Lord against Israel. Thus says the Lord. Now, who is talking here? Who stretches out the heavens? Who lays the foundations of the earth? Who forms the spirit of man within him? In other words, he's the creator, sustainer, God. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding people when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall happen. In that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. Now, there's just you want some little thoughts in here at the end. It's called Jerusalem and Judah. Judah, that's a very specific geographic place. You know, I really think that all this stuff is going to happen. This giving away the West Bank. I believe that Israel is going to get down and reduced down to Probably the region of Judah, which is the part that the whole world kind of accepts them to have. But it's still not going to be enough. And the Muslims are still going to be screaming. And so look what's going to continue to happen. Verse 3. And it will happen in that day, its future, that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone. Now it goes beyond the surrounding people. Look what it says in verse 3. For all peoples. Remember, God doesn't exaggerate. We're prone to exaggerate. You know, we love to maximize some parts of the story and minimize others. And we love to always, you know, exaggerate and spin. God doesn't spin. OK, when he says all, he means all. So it's going to happen in that day that Jerusalem will be a heavy stone for all peoples and all would heave it away and surely be cut in pieces, though all nations of the earth are gathered against it. All nations of the earth are gathered against it. Zip down to verse 9. And it shall be in that day I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. So the world ends with Jerusalem inhabited by Jewish people in this area of Judah that the whole world is opposed to and the whole world is converging on. And all the nations that come against Jerusalem, God says, I will seek to destroy. You ever heard of Armageddon? Armageddon is, is Jesus on the way to rescuing Jerusalem. And on the way, he wipes out all the armies of the world up there. And he goes on to the city of Jerusalem. And look what he does there in verse 10. And I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem. These are, these are literal descendants, Jewish people. This is not the church. There's no way you can push in Christians into this. This is the house of David. This is on the inhabitants of Jerusalem. 
I will pour out the spirit of grace and supplication. Verse 10 continues, Then they will look on me whom they have pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieves as for a firstborn. You know what the Bible says? It says there's going to be a, a wonderful conversion of a group of people in Jerusalem as all the armies are coming in and as they're starting to destroy them. It says actually two-thirds of them will be destroyed and one-third will be remaining. And it's kind of the final holocaust. All the Jews are in one place and finally Satan's dream is taking place. And just as there two-thirds of them are gone, one third of them in that moment look up. And as they look up, breaking through the clouds is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And all of a sudden it connects and they say, That's Jesus that our forefathers crucified. You are the Messiah. And as they drop to their knees, you read the rest, it's really gross. The Lord makes all the armies. Their eyes melt in their sockets. Their tongues melt in their mouths. It's like a neutron bomb. And everyone that's opposing Israel is destroyed in an instant. And you can read the rest of the story. It starts in Revelation chapter 20. Jesus believed prophecy. Jesus believed history. Jesus believed science as presented in the Bible. What's the last one? Jesus believed that the Bible presented the only authentic message of salvation. And just like science has gone awry, and history has been rewritten, and just like prophecy is ignored, in most of the 330,000 churches in America, there's great confusion of what salvation really is about. That's why Jesus said, at the end, the majority of the Christian world will not truly be saved. Have you read that? At the last days, most people who call themselves Christians aren't. That's Matthew 7. Now to read it, it's very chilling. It's Jesus' account of the end and how few there are who have truly embraced Christ. What are the implications of Christ's conviction in Scripture? They're very sobering. Should change your view of science, should change your view of history, should change your view of prophecy. And we should change it to what Jesus believed.